cult Thai right. culture, Thai uh, uh, social behavior that I I can't find any logic in. But Theravada Buddhism is built out of uh, these two and a half thousand year old Chinese philosophies. No. So uh, <laughs> I'm using that to, to help me understand my... Uh, my uh, so apparently no, Marc Antoine's no, understanding of the history of Buddhism is different. Go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's very different. Now, it's, it's true that in the Chinese sphere of influence, there are Buddhism mixed with Taoism. Uh, but but they are very distinct and they are different strands. Theravada Buddhism is certainly not built out of, I mean, the, the, the Buddha was probably neither a Hindu nor a Taoist, uh, a historical Buddha. Uh, the, the, the Shakya tribe, which still exists in modern Nepal, and we suspect it might be the same Shakya tribe, was uh, animist to start with. But anyway, that's Origins of Buddhism is a totally different conversation. <laughs> there is Indeed. something Indeed. there is something in my brain called the Thai forest tradition that comes out of Theravada, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I know nothing about. Th Thailand is interesting because it's one, uh, oh no, it's Vietnam, sorry. Vietnam has all three traditions like Theravada, uh, Mahayana, Vajrayana, and mm -hmm. they exist also in some degree in Thailand. Uh, for example, Thich Nhat Hanh is a Zen monk, and Zen is a Mahayana tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, oh no, he's Vietnamese though. So Zen exists in Vietnam. Um, but I think there's also some pr slight presence of Vajrayana in Vietnam. But so I'm going to make our way back to our topic a little bit by saying that Indra's net appears to be sort of slightly derived from the Mahayana Buddhist tradition. Oh yeah, purely Mahayana. Um, and that Indra's net is one of the lovely historic metaphors for what we're talking about and what we're doing. Before we get too much back on, on topic. Yes, um, okay, good. On, on the recording, I, I wanted to make sure to capture, um, Marc Antoine mentioned uh, Ursula K. Le Guin um, and her uh, synthesis of the Tao Te Ching. Tao De Ching. Um, but you also mentioned the Dutch translation, which I didn't capture the spelling of. Yes, absolutely. And I do not have Ursula's um, translation, but I will find it and add it as well. It's in the Zoom chat. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and also, just randomly, as we went through a bunch of uh, philosoph philosoph philosophical schools, it, I was reminded there's a short passage in uh, in one of Neil Stevenson's books. I, I think it's um, uh, the Diamond Age, uh, where he talks about he, he he has a capsule summary of Confucianism, um, which I thought was really funny or insightful or funny so, and insightful. So is it? Um, so I remember distinctly, and I'm pretty sure it was Snow Crash way early. Um, and I could be totally mixing up my histories, but I remember distinctly a passage where he, someone, I thought, I thought it was Stevenson, described Judaism, in, partic in particular Orthodox Judaism, as a perfectly replicating virus, be because generation after generation it replicated itself exactly, like like there, there was really yeah. little deviation from practices. Kind of holographic, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't I don't remember that passage offhand. Yeah. Um, thank you for. Joining here, this is a reset of the stewards call into a let's build stuff kind of call. Let's let's do things. I chose something that seemed like rent low hanging fruit, which was like, what is a guild and what should turn you left on Spruce Street, then turn right on that? Rose Street. I think that is that John Kelly. Are you navigating? That, that is John Kelly. I am in a car uh, and I'm on a phone, but so that's why there's no video. But uh, and I, I don't even see my mic switch. So my, is my mic is open? Yes, it is. is. It? It, it okay. Is. When, when I find the mic switch, I will shut it off. And you know what? You know, hopefully stay with you. I yeah. thought maybe you'd been kidnapped by aliens, and that was like your alien alien leader's voice telling you like which way to go. <laughs> um, so I'm really happy that that's not the case, although slightly intrigued if it had, if it had been. And I because yeah, that, we're in, because we're in my Zoom now, I can actually mute you. So um, oh, all right. Don't... Actually, that would that'll be better. Go yeah. ahead, go ahead and mute me. And uh, when you want me to come in, then then just unmute me and say I come on in, and I'll 
I will, you know, I will pull you, I will pull you shortly until you get home and you can unmute yourself, but I will meet you for now and, uh, okay. enjoy, enjoy the driving and eyes on the road, eyes on the road. Eyes on the road. And before we get on subject, I just, Oh like God. To say okay. Please. It's about four blocks away from me. Wait, what? I could hear from what it said, turn left on Ro Rose and, and scenic or something. I heard a couple of the street names that are where I am. I'm, I'm visiting my mother in, uh, in Berkeley and he's in Berkeley. I can tell that street. Wow. Okay. And, and <laughs> it turns out that I cannot unmute John. I can click ask to unmute, which I did, but I don't know if that put something on your screen, John, uh, but I figured you'd want to reply to that. And now I can't get you back. So there we are. So we flung you into the airlock and now can't bring you back into the transporter. But we know where you are, so we'll send out a search party. If... And, and you found the button, apparently, John. Go ahead. Yeah. So you heard that there's a, a, a time and space coincidence? King Junior Way. Okay. <laughs> He's on King Junior Way. Uh, no, can you can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I found the, I found the, I heard the time and space thing. That's great. He's absolutely right. I am in Berkeley. I'm, I'm leaving a client and heading home to San Francisco. And uh, yeah, I got the button. I got the buttons to appear at the bottom of the screen. So excellent. So we're good. We're good. I'll, I'll now unmute my, I'll, I'll mute myself again and uh, just join you if, if there's a, a relevant comment that I can make. Sounds great. Thank you. Any more digressions? This is fun. We could do this uh, all day. Uh, not digression, but question. Yes, What's please. our timing for this meeting? I do have another meeting at the hour. Um, I've booked it for 90 because that's my habit. And uh, if you have to drop at the hour, that's perfectly groovy. Um, but I've booked it for 90. Um, cool. So. Um, so my instinct was to head toward uh, like using a call or, or probably a couple of calls to figure out some things about guilds that we can hold in common. Uh, we can do the same thing about Crest. We can do the same thing about many other aspects of, of OGM. But now that we've got some infrastructure in massive wiki uh, and a website that we can add things to and move things around in and multiple communication channels and all those things, uh, and a nascent directory in Vincent's work on Trove slash Catalyst, uh, it feels like let like let's bolt things together so that people know where they are and what we're doing and and, and how this all works. Um, uh, open to other suggestions about other other approaches to do this, but um, eager eager to sort of put nails and in, in wood and uh, frame things up. Any thoughts? Okay, um, then let's um, let me just jump into the guild thing for a sec uh, to to sort of. Put, put a little bit of framing around that. And I, I just thought in the shower moments ago that the, the guild framing that World of Warcraft uses, which I know Jack Park is really fond of, is kind of an opposite framing for, hey, Judy, um, it's kind of an opposite framing to what I'm thinking, what, what my own understanding of guilds is. Because in World of Warcraft, a guild is a, a raiding party, basically a, a team, which must have multiple different skills on purpose because you need a blend of skills to actually have a successful raid. And for me, a guild is a practice or a craft, a trade craft that is intentionally narrow in its band of skills. So it's really orthogonal or, or opposite to the, the Warcraft kind of guild. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested in uh, in sort of guilds, and, and there's sort of two layers to guilds for me. One of them is the, the guilds as crafts. And if you look back in medieval days, there were furriers, there were coopers, but, but like within the making of clothing, there were carters, there were like, like there were different kinds of craft, possibly down to too fine a grain, uh, too fine a level of distinction, but there were, there were lots of different trades just to make clothing, right? Um, and and then within a trade, there would be multiple masters in some zone, in some geographic zone, and who would have different sort of guild halls or, or, or guild assemblies, which might have different names. So, so within Carters, there, there might be several, several different kinds of, of uh, functional guilds, uh, depending, and, and then uh, 
and I don't know enough about that aspect of it, but I know a little bit more about sort of the pyramid. Usually it was masters, yeoman, or journeyman, and then apprentices. Your apprenticeships were usually seven years. Uh, once you became, and, and there's this, this uh, a book called uh, Traveling Brothers, which is about uh, uh, going on tramp across Europe and sort of England and Germany were the early sort of guild, uh, guild kind of countries and then other countries kind of joined in. Uh, but once you were a journeyman, it was also called a journeyman because you then uh, took a certificate that said you were, you were already fully apprenticed, you, were, you had gotten to journeyman level, you were given a, a thing called a blank from your guild, which was like the furriers declared that, you know, uh, Judy Benham is a uh, master, is, is a qualified furrier, not a master yet. Uh, and then you would go on tramp. You would basically take your blank and some of your clothes and sometimes your family, and you'd go to the next town and see if the master of your guild needed any labor there. And they were more or less forced to take you. If there was an opening, uh, you, you, got, you settled in and that was your new home possibly for the rest of your life. Uh, and you and you sort of and people made their way around kind of Europe around their country in that way, at a time when there were no good maps of any country, like nobody had surveyed the whole country, and so people who were on tramp got to know kind of more of the country than usual. But that's how 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 the trades kind of evened out uh, practices. And then you kind of had there were not usually more masters than there was business in a town for that trade, and so you kind of had to wait till for the masters to die, or there were power struggles and other other sorts of things, but. Uh, but that, that whole thing is interesting. Uh, industrialization basically tips that and breaks it. Uh, but this, this whole notion of being on trap is really cool. And you can find, you can, uh, tiny, tiny other thing, which is um, when you arrived at a town with your blank and went to the master of your guild uh, and presented your blank, they had to give you something like eight pence for a night, uh, a bed for the night and beer and a meal. And then the next morning, they would walk you around to all the masters of, of your guild in, in town to see if there, was, if there was work. Then if there was no work, they would give you eight pence a mile and, and send you to the next town over because nobody wants an unemployed dude hanging out in town. So, so, so be, when you were on tramp, you were kind of in motion daily uh, or whatever, whatever daily, but pretty soon to, until you found work and then stopped and settled down. Uh, kind of a random, a random way to distribute things. Um, anyway, uh, and there's some really lovely aspects of guild life that I wanted to build on, which is that guild members in a highly functional guild, uh, you're bringing up young people or people, inexperienced people in the trade, you are perfecting the trade. Uh, and back in the day, you were building trade secrets, uh, which you would protect. And in, 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 uh, in our generative frame of mind here, we're actually trying to perfect the guild uh, the trade and make it public, make it really available. And so I'm hoping that that the guilds that we create uh, improve any trade craft that we're associated with and take whatever materials are out there in the world around doing that thing and make them uh, much handier, much more useful. Uh, and then last thing I'll say before I pass it to Marc Antoine uh, is make room for employment of the people in that guild as practitioners of those things uh, around the world. So Marc Antoine then Pete. Uh, I have so much, there's so much that's great about the traditional notion of guilds and certainly in terms of the transmission of a tradition, it's wonderful. And I find fascinating with what you're recounting is how they were using geography as a way to maintain diversity and recombination in the guild. And I think that's essential. Now, if, if I understand well, we're trying to create a guild of generalists and nexualists. Uh, and it's not that we have a... I'm not, sure, I'm, I'm not sure what that last sentence was. Can you say that again? Of generalists, generalists and... Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, generalists and nexialists. I was using Van Vox's term from Voyage oh, okay. of the Space Beagle. But, you know, people making connections. Uh, we're connectors, right? That's the... Uh, of people, of ideas, of whatever. And on the one hand, it's a less established craft, but more important, it is about mixing disciplines. So though I totally agree that there is a value to having these guild as learning environments for uh, transmission about, um, you know, we're, we're trying to hone a craft here. 
But also, on the other hand, we're trying to hone a craft which is about mixing crafts. And that's why Jack is insisting so much of, on the other, the World of Warcraft definition of guilds. And I agree there are two things and we, we need to keep them distinct. But on the other hand, the kind of guild we're building is about mixing specialities and perspectives, I think. Okay, more or less. So, so the kind of project we're in absolutely definitely is what you just said. Like, like Open Global Mind as a thing, as a community of practice, as a, as a network of people trying to do stuff is exactly what you just described. Um, but it involves a few things that are kind of difficult and run really deep, like using maps to express things and remember things and mind things, or facilitating a fantastic meeting and getting people who hate each other to do something together, uh, or um, simplifying and distributing information and separating information from applications and designing an information architecture that is robust and reliable in a distributed way. Oh, and then, and then I don't know how many of those ors there are given the, the scope or aim of OGM, but what, but my instinct, and I, I'm happy to be convinced otherwise, my instinct is that each of those things runs damn deep and, and that if we can define them nicely and then remix them a lot in quests and projects and everything else, like, like the remixing is essential for OGM to be healthy and, and do its thing. But if we can refine them, then we become the nexus, the go-to place for people who need uh, a maven for their next meeting, for example, because I think mavenology might be one of might be one of these sorts of guilds. Hey Scott, hey Very Scott. Very quickly to reply to that. Yes, please. Very quickly reply to that, and then Pete. Uh, I agree. There's a deep craft there, and that, as I said, there is a notion of a guild to hone that craft. But I think it's a craft that is based on mixing ideas from different crafts, and that the 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 the, the, the substantial mixing of those other crafts is part of the art. That's it. I like it. Um, Pete? Uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to, to um, I wanted to observe a distinction in history um, between craft guilds and merchant guilds. Um, so they're both called guilds um, and they are different beasts. So I think we're kind of talking about craft guilds here. Merchant guilds were business associations um, and um, you know they they had they worked differently and merchant guilds and crafts guilds were often at odds um, kind of uh, kind of the difference between um, uh, labor and and business um, or something like that um, then uh, I was also just looking around there's also um, uh, just happened to be reading about 14th century Florence um, so there were the greater guilds and the lesser guilds. Um, so there's the fat cats and then the, the little, little people. Um, so there's another kind of, I, so I guess maybe the, the lesson for me or, or the takeaway or, or something is when we say guild, um, we are borrowing a word uh, that is, um, that has varying definitions. And I think we need to be really clear to, to walk somebody into where we're going rather than, you know, okay, it's a guild. Oh, you mean a merchant guild, of course. Oh, you mean a greater guild. Oh, you mean a lesser guild. So this just kind of a, a caution flag. Makes total sense. And I think I was aiming at craft guilds specifically um, because of the notion, because of my preconception that there are some pretty, uh, that, that there's some specialized skills that, that it are involved in this OGME thing, whether it's craft detection or whatever else. Um, Lorelai, welcome to the call. Glad you're here. Um, and you missed some really good digressions at the start of the call, but that, that, that's what we were like in completely different territory. Um, but we recorded and, some of them. Exactly. We, 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 we've got a recording for the whole thing. Uh, so anybody else want to jump in at this point, just sort of the definition of guild and whether it's uh, going to help us achieve our mission. I mean, the reason the reason to pick guilds is that it might be a, a kind of structure that helps us get where to find our best and highest purpose as open global mind, which may require a conversation back to okay, okay, what, what's what's OGM's best and highest purpose? That 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 that's a totally reasonable direction to go in framing up like why guilds and how this works. Uh, other thoughts? Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I was just going to say what you touched on, which is I think it might help at this moment in you know. Uh, like Lionsburg 
and, and the idea that we're putting ourselves in motion a little bit more definition of, of what exactly we're doing. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the mission of OGM as I've understood it is fairly high-minded and broad and bringing it into action mode um, is great. And before we subdivide that and such, maybe a better point on what we're doing. Um, love that. Um, and happy to kind of dive into that more. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to find, um, I'm going to find a document that I've got where I listed sort of a bunch of like, uh, forces at play in the environment, a little bit sort of pattern language like because these forces are happening, OGM kind of exists. So I'm going to find that and repost that list. Uh, in the meantime, John, you unmuted. Did you want to jump in? And Klaus has raised his hand, but John, did you want to jump in? I see that your icon is lit up, but your voice is not coming through. My voice? Terrible. Yes. Uh, okay, now, now uh, we're getting... Let me now try it. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, very rich. Your connection Talk is... About John, possible. you're breaking up a ton. Um, your connection must be lousy wherever you are. Yeah. And there's feedback. I'm in, the, I'm in the toll line. Oh, okay. I will, and there's a um, crash ahead of so you, by the way. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you can hear that. It's very slow. It's very, you know, it's very safe from the point of view of my driving. I will Good. try to speak slowly and clearly. And it's working so much better now. Possibilities. Okay. Possibilities people is not a guild, but let's pretend it is. And let's see how it's the same and different from what you said. It's a mostly craft guild with a little bit of merchant guild. It, uh, the craft is, in, the crafts include uh, meeting facilitation, marketing, branding, um, coaching, uh, coaching of individuals and coaching of teams. A couple of interesting things about it that are different from the uh, classic guild. One is, Everyone in possibilities people assumes that they have to be learning new stuff a significant percentage of the time because they assume that the craft, the stability and legitimacy of the craft is not stable. Uh, some of the things last for a couple of years. I mean, for instance, like scenario planning almost went away. Uh, uh, Design thinking is still very strong, but it's now so broad that it, it doesn't mean anything. You have to say, well, what, what do you mean? What are you going to do with your design thinking? Branding is, is pretty solid. Uh, uh, so, uh, social media marketing is, is solid but unstable because people keep discovering new things about it, and it's also ethically challenged. So if you're a social media marketing person, you need both to know how to do it and how to explain why it really is. If, if you're a possibilities people, social marketer, you not only want to be successful as a social marketer, but you're interested in the ethics of it. So that's another whole uh, dimension. Um, and I guess a cloud over all of this is, the, the assumption is, yes, you will have to spend eh, between minimum 10, more like maybe 30, and in some cases, 50% of your time <laughs> adapting to a new craft and the other big assumption is that marketing is is at least 30 percent you know i mean it's like a huge part of the your life and that there will not be enough work to go around um and that you know it, again it's an ethical consideration to be generous with other possibilities people the, the, they keep saying let's grow the pie not not fight over the pie and, yeah. uh, and people pretty much exhibit that, that generosity in, in the meetings. So that was just all observations, things to take into account as we, so to speak, craft our new definition of what a guild can be. I'm John and I've spoken. <laughs> I love that. Thank you, John. That was great. Um, I can't find my button now. <laughs> oh, no. I'll find it. 
Um, I'll give my, my own reply to that and then would be interested in anyone else's and then we'll go to Klaus. Um, and, and that is that I think what you're describing, John, is a, a, a third kind of entity, which is an organization uh, of some sort uh, that is providing services in the world that is, a, we might call it a company uh, that employs guild members from different guilds, the way I'm envisioning guilds, rather than a guild. And that I, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that OGM becomes a happy platform, a happy home for a variety of offers that solve a lot of problems that we see that are needed. So one, one that has come up that's near to what you just said uh, is enhanced meetings or enhanced events. Like, hey, hey, meetings and events, don't you want uh, don't you want humans who can do research on the spot as you're talking? Don't you want people who are building mind maps or concept maps or researching or, or linking up the ideas that you talked about? Don't you want to trans to transcribe your recording and then do some visual analysis of the transcripts and figure out you know what, what's going on? Don't you want to have a permanent record of the meeting connected to all the ideas of the meeting over time? And might you not be making more effective uh, decisions if those things were around you? And that could be a business, like, like, and, and that might employ people from several different guilds, the way I'm envisioning it, because some of those things are, are kind of different from each other and, and run really deep and, and require some coaching and some learning and the kind of continuous learning that you were describing, John. So, so, so I, I think what you described is, an, is a for benefit or organization or even a nonprofit, but I don't care, but an organization that is you know, creating business in the world whose market is really huge because, um, uh, who was it? Um, uh, Klein, I think, no, uh, who wrote uh, Who Really Matters? Anyway, he wrote, he wrote another book about the origins of, about heretics, the original heretics. He, he was writing about the sort of the beginnings of uh, consultants who would do mind mapping and who were who stopped doing memos and bullet points and started taking things into ideation and all that. Um, I'm forgetting what the heretics is in the title. Um, and so before then, nobody was doing what now we take for granted as how ideation happens, right? That that came kind of new into the world and became a giant business. And then design thinking is, is like that as well, but later. And IDEO kind of, I remember the day Business Week had on its cover, a picture of the, the two brothers who founded IDEO and an article that might as well have been written, been written by the IDEO's publicity person about IDEO and design thinking and the business that they were building and all of that, which you know, must have gotten them a huge amount of business. And I'm thinking that what the things that we're working in have the possibility of being the next wave of those kinds of things. And there's, there's several of them that I can see in, in our horizon, in our event space. And I don't know if anybody agrees or disagrees with that, but um, I'd love to hear. Mark Antoine wiggles his fingers, that's good. Uh, Scott. Um, from the area of design thinking, it always seemed like IDEO had, a, had an agenda behind it to make it their own. Even whether they did or not, you know, they always said it's for the world. Everyone should use it and come to us, and we'll we'll help you do that. You know. Yep. Yep. Uh, and and in the process, tons and tons of people hung a shingle saying that they did design thinking, but the attention clearly went to IDEO. In fact, in fact, I remember there was a quote from somewhere at some point where somebody asked the CEO, "So what is design thinking?" And their answer was, "It's that thing IDEO does." Right? It's like, whoa, okay, somebody ate the space really well. Uh, and then IDEO got into plenty of trouble sort of later on. Luckily, not the kind of trouble McKinsey's been in. Um, so let me go to Klaus then. Mark Scenario Klaus. planning is a little bit the same though, right? Um, and I yes. Can't, can't remember the... Uh, Global Business Network. Yeah, GBM. So, so Peter Schwartz uh, works at Shell, uh, comes out, invents this company with Stuart Brand and a bunch of other people. And, and I and Esther was a member of GBN's sort of smart people's network. So I got sort of absorbed a little bit into that crowd back in the day, met a bunch of interesting people through GBN, which was likewise, but, but then GBN becomes this one trick pony consultancy where all they do is multiple scenario planning. And I was like, damn, that's limited, right? Uh, the chat is very relevant right now, over. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, and let me go to Klaus. Yeah, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around this uh, guilt concept. <clears throat> I mean, I'm... I'm... I'm looking at uh, um, any any kind of project basically as assembling different skill sets, and 
this kind of skill set then becomes a, a unit that uh, is, is designed for very specific kind of outcomes. That could be repetitive, right? I mean, there are people who build skyscrapers uh, and they have a very unique skill set uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, you know, many specialists from engineering, air conditioning, uh, I mean, and so on and so on. And so that that would be uh, maybe something one one could call a guild, um, bridge building, skyscraper building, you know, and and or also and, and engineering in general. Yes. Yeah, uh, but it could also be transferred into mm -hmm. marketing or into uh, you know, other components like this software design, for example. So, um, so I, I get that. I'm not quite sure. Um, what type of skill set we're looking at to solve what type of problems you know, when we are talking about guilds. So I think this is where I'm, I'm struggling to follow. Which means we need to go back to the, the, the sort of the wrapper of OGM, like, you know, what's on the radar here and, and where this goes. So, and, and I'm gonna go there in, in just a second. Um, Judy, got your phone? Okay. Yeah, I got um, it. Thank you. Uh, so, um, so Lorelai pointed out that one of the really dark sides of guilds was restraint of trade, making sure immigrants and outsiders didn't get into the trade, keeping women in their place, a whole series of things that are really crappy. And I totally agree, Lorelai. It's like uh, there, there's a very dark side to what guilds did and restraint of trade and keeping all, the, all their trade secrets secret and making sure nobody understood how that die worked and how, you know, all of that was a sort of, a, they, they saw it as essential to their preserving their livelihoods, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and a lot of these guild halls got really wealthy because they, they managed to sort of hold these restrictions. And I think we're trying to do like a, a white hat guild sort of thing here where incredibly inclusive, everything we develop or think about goes out to the world and is meant to improve that trade and make it easily available to, to the, the person in the farthest corner of the world. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think that we're, I'm hoping to not inherit the mat, that, that dysfunctional mantle and, and do something actually really positive with the framing. And I'm, and I'm totally open to not having guilds here at all, but I, I still sort of think this is interesting. Go ahead, Laura, you wanted to jump in. You uh, said a word that I didn't hear. You said a something cast guild. Uh, what did I say? Something cast? It had an eye sound in it and I couldn't hear it. Uh, do you do you know what I said just before? You were it, it had the meaning of like a good guild, but oh, I don't oh, know what you said. I, I remember now a white hat guild. Great. So I just wanted to point out so that those of us that are embedded in white society don't realize so much of language that ends up being, yeah. So using the contrast of dark and white often and maintains. So yeah, thanks for letting me bring that to your attention. Yeah, thank you. And 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 I, I realize now, white hat, black hat is a terrible, a terrible metaphor to use to to talk about that. How about Robin Hood? No, that doesn't work very well either. Um, anyway, good, uh, like a, a guild of good intentions, a well in, a well intended guild. Um, and thank you, uh, Marc Antoine. Um, I, I when Lorelai mentioned the, the exclusion aspect of guilds, I totally agree, and there is a legitimate reason to exclude which is to preserve good practice, right? So especially in engineering, you don't want anybody to build a bridge without safety considerations. Uh, and in our case, it's an emerging craft and it's not the same thing, but certainly if I think of our guild as more a community, a learning community of practice, right? So what we really need is to be able to have a kind of emerging corpus of this works, this doesn't. <laughs> and it's not so much about excluding people who are not following our practice, but be able to say, well, this is, this has failed for you. It may work for, uh, sorry, this has failed for us so far. It may work for you, but be aware that it's failed for us and why. And if you manage to make it work, great. And tell us how, <laughs> and how it's different. But the whole notion of being able to say, this looks like good practice. This looks like, you know, known, failure points. Uh, I think that's really the important point of building a guild. It's building that corpus. Yes, entirely. And, and we're all about the generative commons and building an extremely useful, accessible corpus. That's like central to, to what OGM is about and flipping the script on education where, 
98% of ed tech ventures I've seen basically have a secret thing that when you stop paying them every month goes away. And it's like, seriously? Education should not be proprietary. It should not be taken away. Let's build scaffolding that lets us transform education, for example, right? <clears throat> and then uh, let me just go back to engineering for one second, because in Canada, the Quebec Bridge failed in 1907 and 1916. It failed twice. And as a result, the Canadian Society of Engineers um, decided to create this, this iron ring and a ceremony around it um, to, to basically heighten the, the, the notion that people's lives were in the hands of engineering and engineering had to become a, a, a craft that was uh, much more responsible than it had been and understood better stresses and whatever else. But, but, uh, but the notion that they upped their game, that they leveled up because of uh, disasters is I think really interesting. Um, and so when you become a, an engineer in Canada, you go through that ritual, through that ceremony and that makes you an engineer, a device that may have been misused over time uh, because who got to get the ring and who was accepted in the schools. And that, that means that other people didn't get to practice engineering. And I don't know. Uh, all these things are certainly open to, uh, to being misused. The boundary but, keeping is always problematic, right? But, yes. but boundaries are essential. I mean, even with the commons, that's Ostrom's work. You need, uh, you need someone to steward the common and there's a boundary there. My and boundary I, minding perhaps. I was in a Keiko Lab meeting yesterday. Pete was there too, and uh, we were speaking. Uh, Klaus uh, <laughs> was uh, was speaking. Was it Klaus? Anyway, so, so, some, someone mentioned the whole uh, example of a community process where they made a much. It was a controversial issue around logging, and there were you know some people who were loggers who were hippies back to land, and it was quite a mix, but. It, what made the conversation sane was only opening it or closing it to anybody who didn't live there. So they maintained the diversity of stakeholders, but you had to have to be part of the community. And uh, that sometimes boundaries are essential and it made a huge difference in how the conversation went. Mm -hmm. um, Scott, did you want to chip in? Um, yeah, we've been going through a lot of my mom's old stuff. She's 85. And she managed to pull out a bunch of pocket watches that I've recently become interested in. And I found out that there's something called the railroad standard of pocket watches. And what that means is that it's accurate to us within a certain amount and that it can be held in different positions and it maintains its accuracy. Now, obviously, they're a little more expensive, but the point was that trains were running into each other because everyone wasn't in sync. And in this case, this was a tool. As long as you had the tool, didn't matter how you got it, you could help maintain the standard. And so it wasn't necessarily about imposing anyone's will. It was simply saying, we're all aligned to this standard, whatever it happens to be. And if you're off, will help you sync back up again, and it's going to keep us all kind of in, in lockstep. And I believe time zones without are being limiting. And I believe time zones are invented for the railroads as well, in order to yeah, solve well, some of those. It's the lines on the road. Yeah. You know, we could all drive without lines on the road, and we'd be freer. But would we? You know, we do need those rails. Um. <clears throat> Where does that leave us? And I'm about to turn toward sort of the broader frame of OGM and, and, and some of that, but uh, anything else we should put on the table before heading that way? Um, cool. Uh, and then the story of the ocean chronometer is equally interesting. Uh, and the book Longitude, long, do you all pronounce it longitude or longitude? Show of hands for longitude? Almost all of us. Okay, good. Um, the book Longitude is lovely. There's other, other, other parts of the story, but, but you know, being able to do a, a chronometer. And apparently Magellan goes around the world for two years, does not make it back alive because he dies in the Philippines, I think. <clears throat> but the clocks on board his ship are only like two minutes off after two, two years at sea, which is insane. It's like unbelievable. First dude circumnavigating the world and his clocks are barely off. That is wow. That's completely remarkable. 
Um, cool. So let me um, let me paste. I don't know if it'll paste properly. Oh, it's not pasting. How about that? Um, let me actually screen share instead. There we go. Boop, boop. Let me screen share instead to just show you the document that I was referring to a little earlier. <clears throat> so um, here's some assumptions behind OGM that we are in the middle of five planetary crises, give or take. And then I'll, I'll give everybody a link. I'll put the link to this document in the chat. But uh, this is the a link to the five crises in my brain, which is the planetary crisis, the 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 racism, sexism, social crisis, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, discourse is broken, which is a I think a really big assumption behind open global mind that um, that we're unable to solve the five crises. We can't actually tackle the five crises because uh, discourse is broken in part because consumerism and a bunch of other things, in part because some actors in the political sphere have figured out that if you can break discourse, you can win elections and run the table and prevent action on those five crises. So, so there's, a, there's a political angle to the breaking of discourse as well, uh, which is the next bullet. Some actors are intentionally undermining discourse and trust. Uh, this process has widened a global cultural divide uh, and then there's another angle, which is just quirky me, because I've been using this brain thing to keep a memory for 23 years. I've discovered that the fact that we don't have a shared memory any better than uh, Wikipedia makes us amnesic, dumber, and easier to manipulate. So there's a whole bunch of people who are busy becoming black belts in their trade craft of spin, manipulation, uh, you know, lying on purpose, all those kinds of things. And that is its own tradecraft, by the way, with, with expertise being passed down, et cetera. Um, uh, then there's this notion that emo emotion and membership trump reason most of the time. So thinking that just if, if only we could make arguments clearer and show the evidence better and convince people we would win is wrong because a lot of what causes these divides and causes people to take opposite positions has to do with being members of a tribe and everybody else in their tribe believes this or is doing this, so they will too. Um, business, which has been trying to avoid politics for years is actually more political than businesses want to admit. This one kind of, I, I don't know how it crept into my head, but I think it's really true is that business is extremely political in particular because there's almost no free markets and there's almost no normal normal businesses, businesses have managed to do regulatory capture or other kinds of capture to almost everything. Um, and we need better tools and techniques for sharing stories, facts, and points of view. The tools we have are quirky and limited and not integrated. Those tools need to interoperate as well as share trustworthy linked contextual data. Uh, the tools, techniques, and data need to be as open and accessible as possible. Uh, a platform, whatever platform means, needs to be credible and durable. Uh, and that means it needs to help its participants make a living through their participation. So there's this notion of, of OGM as providing not just hopefully integrated tools for visualization and dialogue and discourse, but also ways that experts in those crafts could make a living. And that we, OGM, don't have the best answers to climate change and to everything else, but our, one of our best and highest purposes is to help those who do have the best, best answers and then absorb some of their DNA as we move through. So there's a big piece here about outreach and about OGM. I don't think this is a laboratory to, to, to create the best answer to every situation. Um, hopefully this is a, a boiling cauldron in which we, we put a lot of the ideas, allow people to develop points of view about what is, you know, I'm interested in Saul Griffith's best answer to, you know, how all this works. I'm interested in feminist economics uh, best answer to how to solve our way through all these problems, and then very interested in ways of debating, comparing, contrasting, synthesizing, remixing all these different kinds of answers to, to problems. Um, and I'll stop the share now because I can't see you all very well. But th 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 that's kind of a lot of the, th those to me are the forces behind why um, OGM sort of exists as a thing, other than a couple of coincidences and some interesting conversations. Jack, welcome to the call. Thank you. I, I, I just got up and, and, and uh, Mark Antoine reminded me that this was going to be about guilds and so forth. And, and if that's the case, then why shouldn't I be here? Excellent. And Mark Antoine represented uh, some of your approach to, to why guilds. He's uh, qualified. He, he is. He got, the, got the stripes to prove it. Good. Um, so let me stop and see what anybody thinks about what I just shared on the, on the screen. 
Marc Antoine has got jazz hands. That's good. Anybody disagree? Like, 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 this is kind of the narrative, the existence narrative for OGM from my eyes, right? Um, that's all that is. Uh, but it's important because I think I think it it creates some framing. Like, hey, this isn't a, a game B convening where we're going to try to find the best answer, and this isn't theory U where we've got a really interesting idea for a practice and we're going to make that practice solve problems around the world. We see theory U as a not so much a client, but a, a beautiful peer organization with a great following and a terrific idea. And if we can help theory U, like if we can amplify their work and launch, the, you know, help everybody do better, you know, go through the U, that, that, to me, that's brilliant. But equally interesting, like helping Integral actually solve problems. And, and then, you know, the Integral community and the Spiral Dynamics community and name your model. Um, and really interesting to me for people coming in who are curious to find their way to the best models, right? How, how do we help make that happen? Um, go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, I'm just thinking about this project that we're working on with uh, the Global Regeneration Collab, and I've had you know a couple of conversations now with with Sam, who who is going to be the lead uh, guiding us through this project phase. And in the discussion with him, we actually talked about what could OGM be doing uh, to support this process and help us. And what we um, one of the um, uh, sort of structural part of, of this project design uh, has to be to deal with um, uniqueness in each community that is interested in developing a community level food system uh, and then finding commonalities that, that, that connect uh, these food systems. So, a simple, a simple concept, food systems all over the world are the same in its basics, right? Everybody eats breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, in every place, there's a farmer, there's an aggregator, you know, there's a logistics uh, uh, function, there's a processing function, there's a retail wholesale function, and so on. So the, the, the structural components of food systems are the same everywhere in the world. Um, how that then executes at the local level has so many variations, you would never see the commonalities that's behind it, right? So, uh, so we need to develop a process um, that is one of discovery, right? Where we, where we are looking for very specific markers that are always going to be the same, no matter what community we go into, and then find ways to assist the community to create their own story, basically, uh, but following these these very technical uh, mandates of of uh, what what a food system needs to be like you know, in order to function from uh, beginning to end, from farm to fork, so to speak. So I, I see that um, that will require some skill sets that may not have been deployed yet in this field. Now uh, the so, so that's where this kind of innovation comes in, where um, where we are going, we're going to have to develop processes that uh, that can be super standardized and 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 structured, but uh, allow uh, the the modifications in the field, you know, who, who which allow the creativity to unfold in the in the thing. So that's that's sort of uh, is maybe where I see us going. I, Klaus, I agree with everything you just said. And then it, it, it rang, you rang like five, five different bells in my head for ancillary topics that matter a lot, like the right to repair relative to John Deere tractors, right? <clears throat> Which are just locked away. And anybody who wants to repair their, their, their thing has to put it up on a trailer, pay a thousand bucks, get it towed to the repair shop. And then like, because there's no access. Um, and a whole bunch of things like that have happened to the industry, which are political in nature uh and require addressing as well um then there's a psychological therapeutic somehow aspect to this um, at the individual and organizational and industrial level so at the industrial level what i mean is a lot of people are trapped inside of a series of systems that keep them kind of prisoner to the current the current arrangement of systems on the ground in their geography wherever they are 
and and how do you intervene with that so that you can actually change to a more functional more fair uh, kind of geography and right now we've had farmer strikes in india because the government offers subsidies on certain crops and they're taking away the subsidy it's like really complicated there have been protests all over india through the pandemic because this is such a, a shit show for for indian farmers and like poor indian farmers they they were self subsistent with food before the british showed up and it's been a nightmare ever since. And I don't know that it was pretty before the British showed up, but boy, it's been a nightmare ever since uh, for, for Indian farmers. Um, yeah. Anyway, there's, there's lots of different levels there. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, I mean, India is actually a really great example because the, the, the problem the, Indi the, in the, the farmers are facing in India right now is that Monsanto, Bayer, Ty Tyson, Cargill, they all have Walmart, but uh, actually, the company that I used to work for, Metro Cash and Carry, was also represented, and I made several trips to to uh, India to uh, support our local team because the Indian market is really quirky in many ways. But uh, uh, the, the, the overriding thing is that they used to have very successful small farms, um, which had uh, uh, very uh, poor logistic systems, very poor communication, you know, inadequate uh, uh, ways to aggregate and so on to support big businesses, right? Because with Walmart coming in there, their uh, supply chain strategies are not conducive to, to the Indian way of, econ of doing things. So I'm, I'm, I've actually been exchanging thoughts on that with, with Sunil, for example, and, and some, some other folks. The, what, what India would need is not to have uh, farmers consolidate and build row crop uh, the, the production, right? That's insane, besides destroying the, the rest of their water and, and topsoil. What they need is a, is a step back, uh, a sophistication revolution in the, in the logistic systems, you know, in aggregation, in, in, in uh, providing communication to farmers so they can plan ahead what to grow when and so on and so on so that's where the revolution in the indian food system should take place not you know in in messing up the farmers themselves but, yeah. but that's a that's a great example you know how um uh, here in the us we are also dealing with a level of concentration which we have to step around right the the, the and, and and rebuild from the ground up uh, a local food system that is at, that is community level connected. Um, just by analogy, um, April gave a talk recently to um, sort of HR departments, and part of her advice was that uh, one of the things you could do is treat flux, treat this constant flow, and and treat the work at home kind of the newfound freedom that people have with with work at home, work from home, because you know, showing up to the office nine to five sort of went away during lockdown and all kinds of different things happened and many adjustments were made. And instead of going back to the old normal to consider upgrading your infrastructure so that it's much more adaptable to these new flows and to people's needs and requirements and personal needs and all that. And to make that the new normal to, to adapt to the need to be really flexible in the way, and this may be a bad analogy, but in a way that you're saying that the markets and infrastructure and delivery systems and supply systems need to adapt to a different rhythm, different scale, different sense of how to get things done in any particular place. And I'm really interested in the in the systems view on, on those two problems, because I think there's some really interesting solutions to be had there if you start looking at this system systemically. And then there's interesting interventions to be done at the political level, at the local level, at the whatever. and and in, in anything I just said that sounds like action, somebody on the world is already doing that damn thing. Like there's already somebody on the ground trying to get that done. How do we amplify their efforts rather than taking on the task ourselves? And how do we find those high functioning groups and say, let, let us help you turbocharge your efforts. And that might mean get more attention. That might mean get the chief minister of agriculture to, to take your meeting. I, I don't know what it means. And I, and I think there's a lot here about hacking systems and trying to figure out uh, how to get through there. Um, Lorelai, you're taking awesome notes and I don't have enough time to absorb them. Would you like to just they're jump not, a little bit? Yeah, they're not notes. I'd love to speak to these things. So Please, fabulous. I appreciate what you presented in your assumptions and uh, something that I wanna point out that is minor on the one hand and actually substantial. I don't think it's important to wordsmith the things now and some of the words that you've used 
to me have, um, I guess, like narrowed things or put things in a particular direction that to me, it's important because it can influence the way we're present to it right now in subtle ways. And then also it might include exclude some people that we want to include. And I just have a list of examples and I, I don't need to go over them now, but these are things to explore. Even a list like this and in a conversation like this can be impactful. So um, so one is just like the word Trump. You just you, you happen to say this like emotion and membership Trump reason. I mean, just the word right now just has so much implication. I will change that word. Good point. Great. And then discourse, the word discourse. When I first saw it, I went, huh, huh, like I felt something and this would be an intuitive thing. So this goes into more somewhat the emotional kind of thing, uh -huh. like something about that word. So I looked it out, it looked it up and it turns out that it does actually imply written and it does imply expertise. Hmm. And so it's got a narrowing flavor. And then also I didn't know this till um, just about two weeks ago. Um, focusing on written actually excludes people of color, particularly black people to some extent, because they have more of an oral focus. And it came up in the conversation about hiring and how to um, how to hire people, uh, BIPOC people, like there are different ways to reach them because of the, the cultural norms. Um, and then let's see, it's going up, so I gotta find my words. Um, <laughs> reason, oh yeah, yeah, so I'm, um, oh, so again, just an um, emotion and membership trumping reason. So for me, I was a scientist and I'm now an intuitive and, and a coach. And I see how reason and science actually overwhelms things in a bad way sometimes. The way Trump dumped science is not good. Making facts not facts is not good. However, science is limited. And so including those other things matters. So talking about it in a, right, a combined inclusive way. Yes. And then uh, I believe you intend don't say explore, collaborate, not only share stories, points of view facts so you said share so using what the, the verbs that that get across more of what we want i think it's the conversation and the dis yeah so use this works is right but the conversation and the play and the expansion and the discovery of what better things are in the the process together so what verb we use right conveys some of it conveys the meaning to people um i wrote open tools techniques data uh what did i write what did i write here we go uh, I don't know exactly what I referred to right there. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So we want tools, techniques, data to be open. I think there's also something about um, like working with Pete on um, GitHub and how the data is protected. So re some reference to that too, in some form. Um, we switch from in the language uh, platform. So tools, techniques, and data need to be open, blah, blah. And then it says our platform needs to be credible, durable. I'm so used to platform being software. And so the clarity there, are we talking process or software or so again, just so that we know what words we mean. Um, and then the phrase make a living. So for me, making a living is like bare sustenance. And it, to me, it might be better to use words like thriving. Okay. Right. So it just examples of some modern language that includes some of, and, and three thriving has to do with me and the context I'm in. So to some extent it implies the, um, the ecology and the, the environment and care for a greater whole. Um, yeah, so th those are some specific things as you read through it, just as I'm, my mind is doing all these things and it, yeah, I think you get that. My impact is that we convey what we want that we don't spend so much time making it perfect, but that we convey what we want. And this, again, I would say is like energetically the impact on people so that the right people, the people that we want to have participate are the people that feel drawn to us. Um, thank you for the gift of what you just said, because um, I haven't had this conversation with anybody about, you know, like, like I feel strongly clearly about those things and I've put them out in places. And what you just said hasn't come back to me until you just said it, which I really deeply appreciate. Um, and I want to go back and recraft this. And I'd love to go back and rethink it uh, as a way of expressing like our mission and what's going on here. Because I think that, that connecting properly to these forces, uh, being honest about them and being inclusive about them is a way of opening a really important set of conversations that could be really productive, right? And you're completely right that, that, that the moment there are a couple of trigger words uh, for, for people, like people start, my metaphor is they fall off the back of the truck. Like, like we're all, you know, when, whenever anybody is presenting or putting forward a thesis, it's like a they have a bunch of people on the back of the truck. And then as things happen, as they say things or do things that don't really mesh with, with, with other people's, ability to understand or belief system or whatever else, they start falling off the back of the truck metaphorically. And I think that, that that's super important to, to figure out. Um, 
because you don't want, you want people to be along for the ride and then to have a good conversation, you know, uh, at some point there. Uh, anybody else on these these themes? Because I that Lorelai, what you just said is really important. I need to go back and change what that thought is called. So I don't. And I know you can't say OJ for orange juice anymore because of OJ and like a lot of words got poisoned, right? So so Trump and and I was doing a little bit of an ironic, I kept the word Trump in there because that thought has been in there for a while. And I kept the word Trump in there because it seemed like an ironic reference, but it's actually a trigger. So uh, bad word. Anybody else with thoughts about these things? Or comments on the list? And and the list is sort of not complete. You're, 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 as you were talking, you were also expanding the list in my head in the sense of, yep, yep, missing a bunch of things here. Uh, the way Jordan Sukut talks about higher purpose and collective goodwill and all that. Um, your languaging around thriving, I love. I, I, I don't like resilience and sustainability because to me, they mean barely surviving and getting back to where you were. And I love flourishing and thriving because they imply uh, doing better than, and they also imply, um, and my wife is using this in speeches a little bit, um, the difference between elasticity and plasticity which may be a bad metaphor, but elasticity, like a rubber band snaps back to its original shape. And plastic, when heated, will remold into some new shape. <clears throat> and what we need is actually a new shape. We can't go back to the, we can't be elastic and just like, wow, we take some big impact and come back to where we were, because where we were doesn't exist kind of anymore in lots of different ways. It's so great. And we need new language because I don't know what the origin of the word plasticity and plastic is. Does it come from making plastic or does it come from something else before we made plastic? And that's why it was called plastic. So. Is, was, pla was the word plastic coined when plastics were invented or did it precede? Uh, that would be really interesting. I'm sure we can. We could find an etymological dictionary on that. That's a great, yeah, great question. Uh, yeah, and that's an example of like, to me, each word has a lot of value, actually. Mm -hmm. And I am 1000% on board. And also, you made me think a lot about the role of intuition and supranatural, supralogical phenomena in this whole process. And when I'm talking about therapeutic interventions at different levels in the system, I I'm a lot going into that. It's like, hmm, um, you know, here's a, here's a person who has great ideas, whose ideas haven't made it into the world uh, yet. What's the intervention that releases those ideas from their from inside their skull into the community of ideas, into the you know out, out into the world where we can sort of figure this out? For example, um, we are five minutes past the hour, we have another 25 minutes. If we'd like to stay, I'm, I'm, I'll be here uh, until then. I'd love to sort of do a critical assessment of the concept of guilds here, um, given what we've said so far. Like, uh, do guilds still make sense to do? I'm, I'm realizing that there's a natural, there's a natural path to, to, to supporting organizations that want to make a thrivable living i don't know if that helps Lorelai, but 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 just saying that want to thrive doesn't doesn't necessarily mean putting money in people's pockets which is i think a, a, a an intention here um but there's a there's a natural quick path to just saying hey let's stand up some businesses that are very ogme and let's make let's get them some some customers and let's some clients rather because i for me customers are one-off purchases and clients are repeat relationships um, and I hate the word consumer. My whole journey for the last 30 years is informed by me realizing that I hated the word consumer back in the early 90s. Um, Jack, please. So we don't use customer, we don't use user, we uh -huh. use member. And member in, in the context of, of our work on this is a member of a K hub, a knowing hub. And a knowing hub is a host for any number of guilds. And it's in that context that you have a knowledge garden. It's a local knowledge garden to that, that let's just call it a tribe. Um, I, I think Mark Antoine told you that there's a couple of senses of guild. One is the, the, the craft guild, the, the ancient sense of a guild. And, and the other, of course, is, is basically an epistemic guild where people are doing some kind of knowledge work, whether it's driving cannons and shooting it, you know, saving damsels in caves or it's out in a structured conversation and holding forth on some some wicked problem and that's the, that's the only sense of the guild that, that i have any you know any uh, horse in this race um so uh, i would ask for jerry's 
tribe, uh, what sense of the guild are they interested in? And, and, and then we can go from and, there. And uh, let me go back, because we, we talked about this a bit before you got on the call, but I, I want to sort of retrace that because <clears throat> I was making a distinction between my own understanding of guilds, which Pete refined because there were craft guilds and trade guilds uh, or merchant guilds. And we really, I'm, I'm looking at craft guilds where my intuition in our, in our framing here, in our setting, is that there are different kinds of things like mapping stuff, like drawing really good maps or understanding semantics and how knowledge is connected or separating data from applications and doing distributed, open, linked, warm, contextual data. That each of those uh, requires pretty deep expertise and is some kind of a craft. And so for me, guilds, I was associating guilds with crafts specifically and separating them from one another so that they could perfect and bring people into that particular craft and figure that out. Um, that's fine. That that so that's not my focus and or nor my interest. Though I agree, it's a good one. And and I contrasted that with the worlds of Warcraft kind of guild, which I believe that it is more toward your framing, where the guild intentionally must have expertise from a variety of different people in order to succeed in its missions, uh, because without a mix, you're actually not going to get things done, right? That, no, that's that's that is my mission on on this planet for the rest of my life is to try and tame conversations the world over uh, and fact, let, let me say it quietly um when i say tame conversations that's code for taming humans that are crazy and and you know we we all know about how in any conversation it's only two minutes before somebody says joe you're an asshole and that's our our guilds exist to block that they can keep it inside the guild do whatever they want but if they want to get anywhere on the leaderboard what comes out is going to be civil so you have a, a highly structured um environment within which a guild is an entity that would in participation have certain rules about how discourse happens and and, and so forth and and yeah. laura light back Sorry, go ahead, Jack. We're going to use a scoring mechanism to to basically promote basic fundamentally a kind of ethos. Um, in in my case, you all, you all probably know that Jay McConigal did a, a, a structured conversation game, but it was first person shooter. Uh, it's called Foresight Engine, and um, when I first heard about it, I just I just blocked the next day because it was going to run 24 hours from 8 a.m. to 8 a.m. the next morning. I just wiped everything off that my calendar and turned the, the cell phone off and uh, played the game. And I recognized it is an IBIS conversation, which is what I worked my PhD work was about. And uh, Within five minutes in the first game, which was called Race for the Cure, it was a, a new neurological disorder with a, with a 10 year incubation rate. And it was the president of the United States who had been diagnosed and therefore please help him and accelerate biomedical research. That's, that was the game and that's my game. And so I jumped in and within five minutes, one of the working hypothesis was kill all the Muslims. Now that 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 node lasted on the screen just long enough that I my brain settled on what the hell, and then it disappeared. And, wow! And um, that's because they have what they call game runners that sit behind, it, the wizards behind the screen, so to speak, that read every node, and so that's their form of censorship. Right. Um, so the Navy bought a license to clone it. The Office of Naval Research uh, created uh, a version of it called Mowgli, massive multiplayer online role-playing game leveraging the internet. <laughs> and it was for their shipyards. They were selling, selling games to their shipyards, but some of them were private because of security reasons. And some of them were open to the public. And so I played all of those. And I won every game I ever played because I know how to play that right up until I published a blog post on how the scoring mechanism works. And I never won again, but I could always claw my way to third, second or third. What I'm saying is, is that 
those were structured conversations, but undisciplined. They were first person shooters. And so the signal to noise ratio was down around zero. You know, I won a lot of points because I, I and a, half a dozen other people, the top three, made points that were hard hitting and well worth, you know, the effort. And the rest of them were just blah, 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 you know, chatting and whatever. The, the Navy ad adapted a new thing where they don't delete your card, they mute it. And it just says muted. So everybody gets to know you made a bad move. And um, what, I'm, what I'm saying is I chose- Jack lost your connection. I did what? Did you hear me? Uh, never mind. It was my, it's my connection that screwed up. Uh, yeah, you've frozen. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I realized at first I thought, first I thought you had frozen, but then I'm looking around. I'm like, oh, everybody's holding really still. This is not good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so sorry, Jack. Um, so I chose the world. Love that. And I, Can and I'm a huge fan of Jane McGonigal's. Uh, say again? Yes. Yeah, I was talking. I'm a huge fan of Jane McGonigal's. Back to you. We all are, and 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 I I played her games and the Navy's version of her games, up until the point that the Navy invited me to come be a, be a wizard behind the screen and still play the game, and then they invited me to Monterey to talk about the future of Mowgli, which Jane's game is offline and the Mo Navy's game is offline because they were both written in an ancient code and were so expensive to run that they, they couldn't make any money with them. But um, what I'm saying is I chose the World of Warcraft model, the Guild Quest model with avatars, because I had done a lot of research on the value of avatars when I was doing my PhD research. I'd read this huge amount of scholarship, mostly centered around World of, Craft, World of Warcraft, and then, of course, John Seeley Brown, who used to run Xerox Park, did a six minute YouTube, which he opened with the sentence, I would rather hire a high level World of Warcraft player than an MBA from Harvard, which convinced me that I was on the right path. So mine are guild quest and the guilds are charged with, with fundamentally internally censored, but what we know from John C. Lee Brown is that over time, guild players in a structured conversation um, stop being ego driven and become eco driven. Otherwise they don't stay in the guild. So it's a way of it, what I say it, this is, I'm not taming conversations, I'm taming humans. And that's, that's, that's how I see this. If you, there's an old saw that many of you probably recall, it goes like, <clears throat> if you take care of your pennies, your dollars will take care of themselves. And so if you map that to, if you take care of the people, <clears throat> the wicked problems will take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. That's a general way to phrase how I see this, this ecosystem. And just by analogy, um, if you take care of the soil, a lot of the rest of agriculture and food and humans like exactly. gets better. That, so that 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 old saw maps to so many places. If we would just get back to making it, you know, our, our, it's almost a biblical statement. It's amazing. Like what you what you you know, uh, you get what you measure, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, when you when you turn the whole economy toward like profit and you do profit primacy, that's you 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 screw everything else up. Uh, and so, and so, uh, so one of the meta objectives of Open Global Mind is how do we help shift humanity's objective functions, right? How do we get people to see that we're interdependent, interrelated, and that if we actually collaborate, like there's plenty around for all of us, we can sort of sort through a lot of our problems and figure things out together, uh, as opposed to the mess that we're in right now. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah. I, 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 it, it seems so that at least from my perspective in the food business that this has to be an asynchronous approach um, because it's very difficult to sway uh, the, the businesses who are, whose business model is vetted to this particular structure that they have developed here and to change 
um, uh, to, to make drastic changes to restore soil back to health, for example, requires modifications to their business model, which would most likely break it. Uh, it it's uh, the, the, the changes inherent in that are simply too significant. And, and it's a vertically integrated supply chain with complementary business structures who are completely interdependent. You take one out and the whole thing collapses. So there has to be an asynchronous approach to the market, meaning the audience is completely different. And now we're working with people who don't necessarily have the business skills or the resource uh, uh, structures uh, so supporting them to, uh, to scale easily. So how to, how to move you know, around the established uh, uh, large corporate structures and, and develop a challenge from ground on up that, that has the potential to scale and has the potential to really shift that system. I think that is, that is the challenge, at least in the food system. Um, we're in too close to our last 10 minutes. So where, does anybody want to summarize how you're feeling about guilds right now relative to OGM? Uh, for me, they seem like important underpinnings to get to organizations that are thriving by creating income for people and solving world problems that matter and uh, cracking the game code that Jack was just describing and all of that. But I might be overcomplicating the situation. Um, I also had, my impression was that a lot of the things that are involved in, in OGM from visualization to figuring out reliable data to craft detection to whatever else require some deep expertise and could become important trades or crafts of, uh, you know, on their own in the future. And, and a piece of what I thought we might be able to do is invent the job descriptions of the, of the next century. Like, like companies need organizations need these kinds of roles and haven't valued them until now, right? Um, so how might that work? Um, Judy, Craig, anybody who hasn't jumped in, any thoughts? Judy, you're muted. There we go. I think we're struggling a little bit with language, or at least I am. Um, the guilds have more of a, of a historical flavor to me versus a different entity name that is collective in intent and capability, but not as restrictive as guild implies. Um, guild feels hierarchical to me, which feels like a non-thriving process. Um, I agree with Lorelei's comment that language like make a living is maybe not optimal. And make a living sounds like we're really back into trade craft, if you will, in the sense of what do we do to be part of the structure that dispenses the wealth? Hmm. I'm not sure that that's the tone. And maybe I'm reading into the word or the connotations of the word intent that's not there. But I like to think our community and our structures are about service, not about gain. And so they need to be rewarding to the people who are in them for a variety of reasons. But if, if the, the tone of money creeping in always makes me uneasy because it leads us back to the rather dysfunctional hierarchy already in place. So um, go ahead. That's, that's a bunch of rambling, but that's kind of where I'm sitting right now. It's not rambling at all. Um, thank you. So one thing is on the hierarchical nature. So, so for me, guilds and I'm sitting in the fake dojo but guilds and martial arts uh, have hierarchies, but the hierarchies are very intentional to take care of the younger folks and bring them into the trade and make sure that when they reach the top that they're very skilled and that they're, they're good, to, good to go to pass on stuff. And a, a piece of the story of guilds that I forgot to tell was the, or, the etymology of the word masterpiece. And when, after you were a journeyman or a, or a yeoman, the way you became the master of your guild, of the guild was you made your masterpiece. So if you were a furrier and that was your, your, your guild, you made the best fur coat or whatever or cape uh, you possibly could. And when your judges, your fellow masters basically said, yep, your masterpiece was basically your PhD. So, so I love the origins of the word masterpiece. Um, then um, 
and master not a good word at this point anymore as well. Uh, so 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 I'm 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 getting convinced that guild is a is a is a bad word with enough. It's got enough negative freight that we can we can dump it. And um, and I just wanted to re reply to making a living. So I thought in my own languaging here, and I'm I'm clearly wrong. Um, I thought making a living was relatively inoffensive way of saying, hey, everybody, there's a way to like make money here and, and we could do this and make and not have to worry about paying the rent and paying the mortgage because this could become how we, how we thrive, how we stay alive, how we whatever. And I didn't know that for a lot of people making a living feels minimalist, feels like, like you're just barely got your nose above water. That I, that I did not know because for me, making a living is cool. It's like, you're making a living, that's great. Uh, so I would love replacement language. I would love to know how to say, hey, there's revenue or incomes available here that you could do great on. And this could be the future of your, in, of your independent self-employed work, not how the man doles out the money, which is, Judy, what you just brought in the conversation too, which I'm like, oh, crap, that's not what I mean. It's, it's like, you know, how do we actually get into this? Um, and then uh, maybe we maybe we just coin a word. So uh, years ago, after an IFTF event, I think, and I love Jane McGonigal. I was part of her Superstruct uh, game. I was one of the I was one of the MCs. I was actually the MC for the Superstruct game ten year forecast uh, that that the IFTF did, built entirely by Jane and a bunch of other people contributing ideas, which was like a high point uh, for group process in my life. Um, uh, and I, I, at some point after one of those meetings, I bought the domain cydron.com just because I thought a cydron is like a group, and I think it was related to a keras, which comes from Kurt Vonnegut's Ice Nine, uh, Kurt Vonnegut's Cat's Cradle. He invents a, a bunch of words like Grand Falloon and uh, Bokononism and the keras. And the keras is your tribe, your group. Uh, that, that's what's in, in a, and a few people have used keras in, in other kinds of contexts. But do we coin a new word here for? people who help other in, people and the word just crept into my head which was talent what if we had a circle of talents or somehow use an attributional word that isn't as loaded with hierarchical tone yeah um i could totally go for that um and i think i think let's let's do on that and see where that takes us but i love uh, so i i have been i have been adequately dissuaded that guilds are a good framing for a variety of reasons now um, but I'm looking for, um, does, this, does this role or spot in how OGM might function matter? Like, let's, let's pretend we find a great new name for because, it. Because people, people have multiple and different talents and their talents grow and develop as they use them. And so in that sense, the, the, um, the, the metaphor for the, the advancement into mastery in various things, whether it's Tai Chi or something else. I mean, there is, there is a gradient of talents, but, but it's, it's one that's constantly shifting as individuals learn from their masters and become like masters or in the theater profession, it's the same sort of thing. I mean, there's a lot of, I, th I think we may want to look to more of the arts terms than the technical science terms because mm -hmm. they tend to be more inclusive and more flexible and I, I like the notion that there could be, we could have a lot of different circles and mm -hmm. the circles could be dimensionally defined by the members of the circle and modified when a new member comes in, if that adds another dimension to the circle. Mm -hmm. So it, it also, I also like the perpetuality of a circle because it's yeah. endless. <laughs> Um, a lot of HR departments have renamed themselves talent management, talent uh, attract, you know, talent acquisition. And, and April's giving a speech now where she's like, one of the points she's making is forget talent acquisition. You don't buy people. Mm -hmm. uh, talent attraction, maybe. And it's nice that they've switched to talent, but acquisition, seriously. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Lorelai. I think it might be helpful to talk about the concepts that we want the word to include as a way of finding the words. So my sense is that we, we wanna have something that describes individuals and projects with resonance come together in a way that's not exclusionary, like that, that people that aren't a fit know, but at the same time that we don't, a lot of the words have narrowing flavors. That's why I think like guild is narrowing and, and league is narrowing and how to have it in a way that, and it, 
allows for the resonance and the collection of something that's related to come together in a way that's not exclusive. And then also that it implies somehow more coming from it, like greater and more. And at the same time that it isn't simply a focus on greater and more for the purpose of greater and more, right? So it's how to find something that, whatever other characteristics are important, but something that includes all those kinds of things is in the flavor of the language. Love that, Klaus? Yeah, it, it seems to be important so to, to have, um, to maintain the definition of skill in whichever way, for example, to Tai Chi, I mean, we have different colored bells, right, that, that, that indicate a degree. In the German traits system, you have the apprentice, you have the journeyman, and you have the master, uh, you know, and it's the, the master chef. So, so maybe there's another word, but people really respond to this, particularly in the trade uh, environment. You know, they, 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 the recognition that I have advanced my skills and I'm being recognized for the advance in my skills is an important component in personal development. And, and people really take to this. There's a sense of pride. You know, I have achieved uh, a level of mastery in my, in my profession or in my endeavor. So I, I don't mm -hmm. think want to lose that aspect. And, and there's an aspect here of guardianship, stewardship, care, nurturing, um, connectedness, uh, mutual care, mutual aid. There's, there's a whole bunch here about interconnectivity, interdependence, um, and acting with the intention of improving all those kinds of things. Um, just, uh, this, is, this is tangential, but it's a little bit of dojo. Um, I, I own, um, my sport is Aikido. And I believe in upward spiral and uplift. And sorry, second small side note, I just got a cold email a month ago from Paul Crafell, who is the, the author of a video that Arthur Brock sent me 20 years ago about upward spiral and how Crafell with a hand trowel was going around the hillsides in Northern California near where he lives, repairing hillsides by understanding the mechanics of water and how water can damage a hillside. And he sent me a cold email saying, I Googled my name and you came up. So you're the first email I'm sending because I'd like to, I'm 70 something years old. I'd like to sort of do something with the last years of my life. And like, how can we play? And I, I described OGM to him and he may, he, he may enter our conversation. His, he's teaching. So his school year is just wrapping up and, and uh, I'm hoping to bring him into our conversations here. But as part of Arthur putting... Paul's video in front of me years ago, I became a fan of upward spiral and uplift. So I invented a practice I call Upkido and I bought upkido.com, which is a martial art for better or worse is martial. I hate that about martial arts, but they are martial, but Aikido is a defensive martial art, but it's all about what if, what if everything you touched benefited from your presence is the, con the concept behind Upkido. It's like, what if, and Aikido is all about blending energies and using the energy that's present in the environment. Those are all just native Aikido concepts, right? Uh, so, so what if your presence uh, in anything, in a project with people, whatever, always improve things? And, and I, I try to go about life like making people smile. I like, I'm like, every email, every interaction is an opportunity to, to, to like have a smile at the other end. So I, I put a little bit of life energy into that all the time. But, but what, what might that look like as a practice? And does that fit in our model here? Because that is about uplift, right? Well, I liked Michael's suggestion of bands because bands are fluid. They take in new members, people take different roles in the band. There are leads in the band, um, but they may be situational. Um, and there's certainly recognition within the band of the musical talent, if you're in a musical band, the talent level of the individual. Um, but it's not very hierarchical in how that's defined. And jazz is a nice metaphor here. Lorelai did put in the chat that band is, is uh, misused a bit for indigenous. You're muted, Lorelai. Oh. Yeah, I don't know that for certain, but that's certainly one of the immediate things that comes to mind for me. So I'm looking up to see if that's true. It may be really hard to find a word that isn't afraid. And it's a little bit what Scott was saying. It's like, hey, whatever word we land on is going to have some baggage. And, and one thing we can do is responsibly point that out and say, we're, we'd like to unload from that. Or well, we circles, go with it. Or, I don't think circles have any pejorative tone to them. And yeah, circles are good. Circles are endless and they're continuing and they're flexible and they're expanding or contracting or they're their circles are really an interesting 
<clears throat> infinity, infinity option in a way. And holacracy, which is one of many ways of organizing enterprises, but holacracy talks all about circles and, and they've sort of got different levels of circles. The problem with circle is that it's, it's such a lovely generic that it operates at almost any level. And it's hard to figure out what do you mean by circle, right? It's, it's, it, it's, you, need to, you need to either qualify it like an X kind of circle uh, or a, a team circle. I don't know, like so that you have an idea of scale and purpose around around the, the word. Well, if if you could you could pick terms like um, software circle, technology circle, process circle. There are all sorts of descriptors for circle if circles want to define themselves. And Circling got trademarked. Crazy. <laughs> I know, and so like a whole bunch of us have been using it for the last you know ten years. They got they went back to their first dates of nineteen ninety eight. So. Just saying, so when we circle, we just gotta be careful that we don't say circling, but. Good Lord. This is a little bit like colors, like a lot of colors are patented, right? Like Ferrari red, you cannot use, McDonald's red, uh, you cannot use. There's a whole bunch of colors that are just off limits. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, I'm an so IP consultant, or IP consultant, sorry. Uh, um, so, uh, this, this feels like it's been a really generative, fruitful conversation. I am, I am successfully sold off the notion of using the word guild. I still have this open question about that layer of activity of, of collecting up and nurturing a craft or a trade or a practice or a skill and bringing people up into it and making sure that it performs really, really well uh, and all that. Like, is that an important aspect of how OGM should organize itself? And we can find a way to, to, to call it something. Um, but is that an important aspect of our, of our organizational structure? I'm really interested in that. Um, and I still suspect it is. My, my instinct is still yes, um, although apparently the naming of it is thorny, um, but happy to continue on that quest. Uh, this will be a standing call. So if you feel like doing this and doing this more, and, and, and um, Let's use the stewards channel on Mattermost to talk about this. So, uh, so in our Mattermost chats, uh, we will take there's there's an existing channel uh, called Stewards, which I will put a link to uh, right now. Ba -ba -da -ba. <clears throat> Copy link. I, I also had a process question, Jerry. I'm, yes. I'm fine with using Google Chat or with using the Zoom chat, but we had been in these groups in order to make it sort of easily accessible to people using the, not the Zoom chat, but the Mattermost chat. And a failure of mine at the beginning of this meeting is saying exactly what you just said and saying, hey, let's use the Mattermost chat. So um, belatedly, I'm agreeing with you and let's start from next uh, Tuesday forward doing exactly that. But in between calls, if you have a bright idea about what to call a guild, put it in the Mattermost chat and let's use that to focus this conversation. But also, um, but also, let's list what are the practical things that that we can do to bring o, you know to breathe life into OGM and to make it more of an entity because we that's really important. Well, and so far, we've been we've been sort of struggling with a bunch of different moving parts and working parts. And I think we can kind of move into it now. Go ahead, Judy. One of the things might be to just start in the channel a discussion of concentration zones or something like that, for lack of a better term, because I'm thinking that as we talk about what a guild might be, which now might be something, a circle, a circle of XYZ, what would the XYZs be? There could mm -hmm. be technology, there could be process, there could be um, mapping, there could be storytelling. I mean, there's a whole, a rather limitless list of potential options, but if we, perhaps begin to create that limitless list with some definition that will help us with what the structures need to be. Cool, thank you. Any last words for this call? Nice I to feel a circle. I don't think I've met you before. <laughs> cool, go I ahead. I feel a circle, might, a circle might be defined as <laughs> a group of people who be behave like members of a guild. <laughs> I, I really don't have a problem with the term guild. It's a, it's a, a collection of experts, artisans or merchants. It sounds hi hierarchical. There, there has to be some expertise 
it's maybe it's a member. Because in, oh, in my genre, we had knitting circles and book club circles and various other things in graduate school. And, and Scott's very point. non hierarchical and very open and inclusive. It's sort of anybody who wanted to come came. <laughs> and Scott just pointed out in the chat that inner circle is, in fact, exclusionary and circling in for the kill and a bunch of other stuff like that. So, <laughs> yeah. oh, we'll wrestle yeah. with that. Well, I do you think Scott was saying that a little bit, you know, in a devil's advocacy way, if I didn't read you wrong, Scott. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Every, every, Everything is everything is a little bit problematic. I do I do think circle has a lot more equality to it than some of the, the terms we've used. I think that the guild thing outwardly, I, I'd never said anything about it, but since I came and saw quests and guilds, I thought like this is a group of X D and D players and you know World of, and it just seems like and you know. Game of Thrones fans or whatever, and it, it doesn't seem contemporary. Oops, you just froze in the middle of a great sentence. Medieval, somehow, so. Uh, Michael, could you say that last sentence again? You just froze, I think, for all of us in the middle of that sentence, and you, it was oh, great. I said, um, when, I, when I first came and saw guilds and quests as part of the terminology in OGM. It seemed, it seemed dissonant with what OGM, I perceived OGM to be, and it sounded, it sounded very white, male, medieval, uh, just, just far away. It didn't sound contemporary. Love that. Um, thank you. And that, that, that's a really great point. Lorelai? Yeah, I want to say something that I feel, um, I feel scared. Um, I feel like I'm taking a risk in sharing this. Um, and part of what I'm learning is that it's really important that we help educate each other and that we aim to call things in where we all have opportunities to learn and grow. Um, I think it was in the Kiko Lab call yesterday yeah, today's Tuesday. Um, there was some discussion about humor. And I think earlier in this call, there was some comment about humor too. And um, Judith, I don't want to be having, I don't want to share that had you feel uncomfortable. I think you, um, I think it was your voice. Someone just made a joke about, um, about circles. And um, I don't remember what term it was, but it was like an exclusionary way of circle. And it was meant as a joke. I ju just who shared that Judith it might have been so so in in the chat Scott said typed in that inner circle is exclusionary and then he said hey every term can has this complexity so I yeah. then I then read that into the conversation maybe it was so maybe Jerry you said it so I yeah. I am um, so this is a very how to say the thing that I feel scared about is I don't want to be wasting time and there's something that feels important here to me and I don't want us to get I don't want any group that I'm part of to get so serious and so careful that we can't be creative. And an impact that that I have physically on my body right now, and it could be just again my own history and my stuff, but I'm thinking about what it would be like if there were, say, a black person that's in this group right now. The joke, I think, is intended to mean um, like we could take all these things to an extreme, like we could look at everything this way. The thing is that it's making a bit of an analogy between that example and the examples we spoke about earlier. And if there were a black person in here that really was offended by one of the other words, it's kind of making a comparison saying that that is the equivalent of, and, and it's an unintentional, it's an unintentionally shaming people to keep them quiet or to, um, equate things that I think aren't equal. And I'm, I'm, part of what I'm a stand for in the world is to keep eliminating ways that I'm racist in ways that I don't, racist or sexist or any of those things in ways that I don't recognize and to empower the spaces that I'm in so that we also hold those values. And things such as jokes and sarcasm and they actually can often be um, unhealthily shaming in ways we don't realize. So I wanna be a place for humor and playfulness and also inclusivity, um, learning to address things in the moment when they happen. 
Yeah. Um, thank you for what you just brought to us. Uh, it's a gift. I appreciate it very much. Um, I'm really interested in what safe humor, safe play looks like and feels like. And I think to a lot of people who are stumbling into uh, modern conversations, it, it, everything feels spiky. And it's like, oh crap. And, 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 and probably justifiably, a lot of those people withdraw from the conversation when it starts feeling less safe for them in ways that have felt unsafe for other participants forever. And that may just be sort of just desserts, I don't know. Uh, but I think there's there's some, you know there, there's a dynamic going on there, and I'm interested in exploring a little further, uh, and it doesn't have to happen right now at all. But the notion that, um, gosh, you eventually you have to pick a word for something that you're trying to represent, and every word has slightly slight edges, and and let's just let's just pick something, is not meant to be. Let's just pick something, even if it insults that person over there or that subgroup over there. That's not at all the intention of that. And, but it may easily, easily be taken that way. And I don't know if that was a piece of what you were saying a moment ago about being dismissive of it, or what, what if a black person were in the room, how would they feel about it? I have a feeling that there was some of that dynamic there, but I'm not sure, I just want to inquire. And then I'll go to Judy. I'd just like to make two comments. <clears throat> One is that my husband, who was a very wise psychiatrist, <clears throat> once made an offhand comment that almost all humor has hostility at the root. Um, <laughs> And if you think about it, it frequently does. Um, and then that hostility may or may not be detected. Well, I don't know. If you talk about the humor of animals jumping around, maybe not. But if you think about anything said in humor about a person, it, it can anyway. So I think being sensitive to that's important, as Laurel, I brought up. I, I, I would also say that, that one of the most frequent forms of discriminatory behavior is humor. And if you anything that got said to me in the early days of feminism was can't you take a joke was the response if i sort of gently called the question it was never meant to be serious it was humor wow. and so i think there's a, a tint or discoloration to humor that is negative and i think if we're going to use humor then we need to understand how to minimize that or eliminate it because almost anything Humor by its nature may be exclusionary because it might be a quote, inside joke. Um, there's just a lot of dimensions to it that are complicated. So, Which is a really hard thing for me to hear because one of my principal instruments in group facilitation is humor. And I think, I like to think, that I use a bunch of it when I'm doing groups, when something happens and starts, I'd love to find a way to make people laugh. And I'd like to think that the way I use humor is not insulting or built based on anger or based on deprecation. And I don't uh, uh, undercut people. I don't, I, I, if, if, you know, I never use humor where somebody's, somebody's gonna feel bad at the end of the thing I, I, think I, I said. I, that's never my intention. Um, but I'm wondering, like, I would love to have like a replay of, of meetings I've conducted where, and humor I've used to see if I've been screwing that up a lot, so. So Judith, thank you so much for sharing that. That definitely I, your examples I resonate with me a lot. Um, I, I you 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 make me wonder now: is all humor? Does all humor have like a to me a shaming quality of a pushing down or a pushing out? And I don't know if it does. I'm not like, sure. As you mentioned, does, like sometimes it might right humor and joy like the mix up of there. Yeah. So Jerry, I appreciate your um, what your aim has been, and how do how do I how do we look freshly at what we do uh, and make new choices in what we do in a way that still has us be open and flowing and yeah. And, and maybe, I, going backwards to me is not so useful. It's more of an openness looking forward and seeing how we can, yeah, how we can yeah. do more good in, in what we do, what we say. So maybe one thing to do, and if this is possible, is to create a safe feedback loop for when something goes wrong. And, and Lorelei, you are brave and wonderful in doing this consistently. And, and like um, you are feeding back to us things that we might be doing or saying that just aren't working in different kinds of ways. And that's fabulous. But also in, in terms of, you know, uses of humor or whatever else, just to be able to be able to say, hey, that didn't work or that didn't land or here's here's what what you know what was happening there. But I think if we can keep that going, then we can explore our way into this new way of being together. And that might be fruitful. Well, 
one 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 option might be self-deprecating humor. Um, it's almost always not threatening to other people if you make a joke about yourself. Um, so that, I happen to I happen to know the world's expert at that. So it's David Weinberger. <laughs> he, like constant constant self-deprecation all the time. There's other very good people at it, but whew, man. I say that that could be an extreme that's unhealthy too. I just want to say yeah, of all the things yeah. we've said today, circle seems the most neutral at the moment. I think I'd love to find something that for me is more energizing, like juicy or um, and I, I love the word up keto that you did. Thank you. Oh, thank you. How about flaming circle? Does that have more energy? <laughs> no. Okay. Not good. Not good. I was just, yeah. And that was, was that that was a little bit of humor. Was, was that like, that was okay. did that work that was, okay? That was fine. And, and then jump to incendiary circles because we want to make trouble. Okay. Um. <laughs> See? See? There we go. Now we're, now we're logging. So my dad, I think one of his first jobs in the world was timber cruising in the Sierra Nevadas. He went to Berkeley, he became a civil engineer. And I think, I think his summer work was measuring stands of timber to cut down uh, for logging. And so one of his, one of his sayings later was now we're logging, which I'm not sure anybody says in the world, but I like, it's part of my vocabulary, but I realized later like, oh, right. Now we're logging. That's what loggers would say to each other. Uh, Michael, go ahead. I thought you were just trying to jump in. Oh, I just said good trouble when you were talking about incendiary. Oh, awesome. Um, so having had our, our incendiary conversation, shall we wrap this call? I think so. Yeah, thank you so much. This is- I, Two hours. <laughs> yeah, uh, I love this conversation. I appreciate your being here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye for now. All. My head is spinning. Aye, excellent. In a nice way. Good. <laughs> in a circular kind Good of way. See you again, Craig. Uh, yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. Have a great day, all. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.